Things started here, and that should be good. Well, I'm gonna kind of try to give everyone a few minutes to get admitted. So I do have a, I've got to have a couple of questions that have come in about the uh, reflection logs. They were in real quick before we get started with this session. We, uh, as far as the reflection log goes, uh, I'm only asking for six reflection logs and that you pick, I'd like you to pick six sessions uh, to reflect on. You don't have to complete them at the end of each session. I would like you to give feedback on the end of each session if you can. I wanna know where we can improve, also what we can do to make things better, to make them uh, more educational for you. So if you have any problems with that, let me know uh, on logs. They are in a PDF format. I can also give them to you in a Word format if you need later but they're not due to be turned in until the very uh, last session and I will provide a Google link for Google Form for you to upload everything in after that point. So I'll continue with bidding people, but we are gonna go ahead and start uh, recording here and getting our session ready. And I'm gonna introduce our next guest. Um, Sylvia Fodi is the author of a memoir called The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. She's an award-winning investigative journalist in Chicago and a high school literature teacher. She hold a, holds a master's degree in journalism, education, and creative nonfiction. Sylvia made a deathbed promise to her mother to write a book about her famous World War II her hero, grandfather Jonas Norieka, 21 years ago. Sylvia's grandmother begged her not to write about her husband. Just let history die, she whispered. Sylvia had no idea about and in keeping her promise to her mother, her discoveries would bring her to a personal crisis, challenging her Catholic faith, unearth Holocaust denial, and expose an official cover-up by the Lithuanian government. Her goal in writing the story of her grandfather, known as General Storm in Lithuania, is to upend Lithuania's narrative that the Lithuanians had nothing to do with killing the Jews, and that it was all done by German Nazis. I'd like to welcome Sylvia with us today. Sylvia, oh, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, uh, am so glad you're here with us. I'm gonna go ahead and turn everything over to you and let you get started. Thank you again, we're ready to start. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. I'm so happy to be here. Good morning from Chicago. Good morning. Breeze, 10 a.m. over here. Uh, and it's gonna be raining today, so. Uh, that's Chicago for you. Anyway, I'm so happy to be here and I'm going to try to share my screen as I get through all this. Okay, so hopefully you see a PowerPoint. I, we do. Okay. So this is the book, this is my memoir that just came out about 10 weeks ago uh, called The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal. Um, I think that uh, for educators, I would position this as a study in Holocaust distortion uh, or denial, uh, but in Lithuania, they couldn't really deny Holocaust because it did happen in their country, but they could just sort their role in it. And uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, which is almost like a whole other presentation. But um, what I wanted to do today 
was uh, give you my own personal story. This is what usually hooks people into the into the whole story, why and how I wrote the book. And then I, you know, um, my last day of school was over a week ago teaching. And so uh, I spent the whole, my whole first week of vacation working on lesson plans based on my book, which was uh, very interesting for me to do. I've never done a lesson plan on a book that I had written. So it was a very interesting exercise. Um, but I came up with lesson plans for social studies teachers and uh, language arts teachers. So I thought I could share those with you. And then at the end, um, we could have some question and answers. So I'm thinking it would be best if you just start posting your questions as they come along. And then I'll, uh, at the end, start scrolling through them and answer them. I understand that you're all muted. So uh, this is how I guess we're gonna work at it. Um, so here's my personal story. Um, I only knew that my grandfather, Jonas Nareka, was a hero until the year 2000. At that point, I was 38 years old. And I grew up in Chicago in a very insular Lithuanian community, uh, spoke Lithuanian the first five, you know, first five years only Lithuanian, so that when I went to kindergarten, even though I was born here in Chicago in the United States, when I went to kindergarten, I couldn't speak English. And this was a point of pride for Lithuanians to raise their children in this manner so that they would be so Lithuanian as they continue on. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've had tw now 21 years to reflect on all this. It took me 21 years to get the book out. And, um, you know, in a sense, what my grandfather, the study study of my grandfather's life and his effect on on me, is a study in glamorizing a perpetrator by hiding his deeds through a grand lie, which is that he's a hero in Lithuania. Um, and I don't know if this is you know subconsciously done in the country or or if it's a conscious thing i almost you know because i'm lithuanian i always want to defend lithuania and so i'm almost leaning toward it being a subconscious motivation they don't really know what they're doing and they're not really aware of uh what my grandfather did and what lithuanians did and so now we're 80 years later this is the 80 year anniversary of the holocaust in lithuania uh, 95 percent were killed in 1941 and um so lithuania is in a quandary over what to do over 1941 actually because in june 1941 they uh, had their first rebellion against the communists and they won because the communists took over the country in 1940 and in 1941 they got the communists out the part that has been hidden to many Lithuanians, including myself, until I dug into the stories, that also in 1941, the Lithuanians worked with the Germans and that ushered in the Holocaust. So this is the part of the story that has been literally unavailable to the consciousness of Lithuanians. Uh, ever since the Soviet Union took over the second time in 1944. Um, so here's my grandfather, Jonas Nareka. He was born in 1910, died in 1947, uh, died at the age of 36. He has a late birthday in October and he died in February. So that's what makes him, uh, made him 36. But I thought I would ask you uh, maybe to put in chat how you think his looks helped in the deception because i grew i grew up looking at this picture all my life it wasn't colorized it got colorized uh very recently i, I grew up looking at a black and white picture of him all my life uh, you know i grew up in the 1960s i was a teenager in the 1970s 
And I saw this face every day. And it affect, the way he looks to me affected me. And I think it affects a lot of people almost the same way. Uh, Stephen, can you, are, are any uh, comments coming in? Is there any way for you to- Yeah, let's see. We're gonna look at the chat. Here we've got, uh, he looks handsome and brave. Uh, people are naturally drawn to nice looking people. Uh, the blue eyes. Uh, he has an appealing look that would be the perfect poster boy representing a hero, brave, young, bright eyes, proud, very distinguished in a uniform. We've got lots of lots of nice comments about his look. Yes, he is a uh, yeah, it's a, a, yeah, definitely. I've got this is shocking to me. Uh, in, uh, well, this is the, his looks are shocking to you. I know. <laughs> Renee, is that what you're trying to uh, say there? Is it, or just what she's talking about in general? <laughs> is it the story? Okay, the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's what I thought. I said, his looks are shocking. <laughs> but yeah, uh, definitely. So I think yeah. in, in general, just the fact that he's a, he's uh, you know so he's so nice looking. He's got those piercing blue eyes. Oh, I like it. Looks like Superman. Yeah, he does have I that. I haven't heard yet. that one yet. <laughs> okay. That's a new one. But the I uniform looks the, the uniform looks uncomfortable. Yeah, I, I don't know that I'd want something choking me around the neck like that. That's yeah. So so I think you're you're mirroring my own sort of thoughts and really Lithuanian's thoughts that this is not a villain, this is not a perpetrator, this is not a monster. Um, and his looks really contribute. I think to the idea that he was such a such a hero, and I I romanticized. He was a very romantic figure for me, even though I never met him. But you know, in my book, I think one of the first lines I talk about is how my grandfather married him because he looked like a Hollywood movie star, as one of the reasons. And he was a rising star in Lithuania already when they when they were dating. Uh, very charismatic, you know um a very successful a lawyer when they met or, or maybe going to law school still when they met but he was already in the army i think he was a lieutenant by the time they met and he became a captain he ultimately became a captain so um i'm just going to give you some brief background on him this is how i grew up hearing about him and how all lithuanians essentially heard about him uh he died in a kgb prison in 1947 he was tortured and um he was caught by the kgb because in 1945 he was trying to lead a rebellion against the communists and he was trying to unite all the partisans to fight against the communists to free lithuania so that lithuania could have its independence and I mean, what's not to love about this? So, um, and then he, he died a martyr for Lithuania's freedom. He was shot in the back of his skull with two bullets, buried a few blocks away, covered in limestone. Uh, and they only dug up his body after Lithuania got its freedom again in 1990. I think they, the archeologists finally were digging him up in 94 his bones. So uh, before that, he led a rebellion against, uh, so that, that was the time that he led a rebellion against the Soviets in 1945 and he lost, and he lost his life for it. He was in a Nazi concentration camp for two years. This also contributes to his uh, aura of heroism. Um, it, but it, you know, my the story I grew up with and that many Lithuanians still believe is that it was for saving Jews. That is not true, but that's that was the case. That was the story for many years. Uh, during the Nazi um, occupation, he was head of the Shole district. He essentially, he was like the governor of Shole from 1941 to 1943, and um, and he led an uprising against the Soviets in 1941. That's the one that ushered in the Holocaust. But I didn't hear that Holocaust side of the story until I started digging into all this. So for 30 
five years, this is all I knew. And uh, my mom, of course, had been working on writing a book about him. This was this was going to be her pro this was her project. So I grew up. Mom is at the typewriter and you know collecting material and talking about her father, and it was all very romantic to me in many ways. Um, and it it sort of gave a lot of meaning to our family. It certainly gave a lot of meaning to uh, my mother. So um, this is my mom receiving the cross of the Vitis on behalf of her father from uh, the president, Algirdas Brazauskas, in 1997. It's the highest honor a Lithuanian could receive after death, posthumously. And I'm in this bottom picture. There's my brother and, um, you know, I'm, I'm over here and that's my mom. So, this is all I knew still in 1997. Uh, but everything changed in January 2000 or started to change. My mom died uh, sort of unexpectedly. She had diabetes, bad back pain. She was only 60 years old. I was 38 then. I expected her to live at least another 20 years. And um, she calls me to her bed in the hospital and uh, says, you have to write the book. Everybody expects it. And so, uh, as you can imagine, it was a very devastating emotional moment for me. I knew she would never, ever, ever want to give over this book, book writing project unless she knew she was dying. And that was, of course, more troubling to me than anything. Um, by that point, she had collected so much material on him. There were 3,000 pages of KGB transcripts from when he was in that KGB prison. Say what you will about the Russians, they have good transcripts. Um, so that was, that was a big deal. She had 77 letters that he wrote to my grandmother from the Stutthof concentration camp. So these were two huge uh, resources that she had left, along with so much more. Behind me are three bookshelves of all the material uh, that she had collected and that I had brought over to my house after her death. So um, she died in February 2000 and um, Right after, shortly after that, like in July 2000, I get my first hint of his dark past, but I didn't even know it was a hint yet. My grandmother survived my mother by uh, five months. And so now it's July. Now my grandmother had another heart attack. I think it was like her third or fourth. She was in her 80s at this point. And she calls me to her bed and she says, Sylvia, how's the book going? And I said, don't worry, what you did, it's fine. It's, it's going great. You know, I'm young, I'm a, I was a journalist at the time. I'm not gonna let it go the way mom did. And I thought I was giving her great words of comfort. And she says, don't write the book, just let history lie. And I had no idea what this meant, why she would say something like that. I, you know, my, my thought was, um, she was trying to lighten my load, kind of let me off the hook, maybe, you know, because she knew my mother had been working on this book for so long that maybe she thought it was unfair of my mother to leave this large request. So that's what I thought. And I said, no, no, you know, I'm going to do it. I promised mom I have to do it. So, um, my, you know, my grandmother rolled over and... I'd face the wall and that was the end of that conversation. And then uh, she died a couple weeks after that, July. So we had uh, my mom and my grandmother, they both wanted to be buried in Lithuania. So they were both cremated in Chicago. And then my brother and I took them to Lithuania and buried them. 
And it turns out it's uh, the 90 year memorial birthday of my grandfather, Jonas Nareka. We, can't, we, we planned it for that. Um, over here is like the first president of Lithuania, Vitotas Landsbergis, who came to the funeral of my mother and my grandmother. And it was like, it was like, the sea parted, you know, everybody, like all, everybody took out their cameras and, you know, were clicking and, and capturing him being there. And my brother and I were just so honored that uh, he came to pay his respects. And he was there because of our grandfather. And uh, it was like the presence of my grandfather was there for his daughter uh, and his wife. Um, right after the funeral, a colleague of my grandfather took me to this uh, building, and it's it's a large uh, it's a library now, the Robluski Library in Lithuania, and on it is a plaque of my grandfather there. My grandfather, when he was trying to lead this rebellion against the communists in 1945, was working as a lawyer in this building. And uh, also plan, you know, planning the underground resistance against the communists. And so they put a plaque up for him there. And it says, in this building, 1945-46, worked a noteworthy resistor, Lithuania's National Council and Lithuania's Armed Forces organizer and leader, Jonas Nareka General Storm, shot February 26, 1947. So those were my last moments of innocence when I saw that plaque, because the next day I heard, I actually heard the rumor the first time in my life. We're at the uh, Jonas Nareka Grammar School in Shukone, which is a little bit north of Shole. This is the town that he was born in. This is the school. When you approach this, you know, that town, it says, uh, the birthplace of Jonas Nareka and like one kilometer. And then uh, this is another rock plaque in my grandfather's name. And this is, of course, is the, the grammar school. And so uh, my brother and I came and we, we were uh, greeted very grandly. The director, the school children were there holding flowers and singing Lithuanian folk songs. And, you know, it was a very emotional moment. And then um, the, grand, the, the director pulls me aside and he says, I heard you writing the book about your grandfather. That's so wonderful. Uh, you know, I'm so glad that you took this over for your mother. You're such a good daughter for doing this. And I said, thank you. And he says, you know, our country really needs its heroes. And I said, you know, as long as I'm here, why don't you let me, why don't you tell me how you named the school after my grandfather? I never heard the story. So he says, well, you know, before we had this horrible Russian name, because Lithuania was occupied by the Russians uh, until 1990. And as soon as we got our independence, we wanted to get rid of that horrible Russian name and put in a good Lithuanian patriotic name. And so your grandfather was born here and he's such a magnificent hero that of course it was natural we would name the school after him. And I thought, oh, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I thought that was the end of the story. But then he pulls me to the side and he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from who? And he says, from the Jews. And I'm like, what could the Jews possibly say about my magnificent grandfather? And he looked at me and he said it so matter of factly. And he said, well, he was accused of killing Jews. So um, that felt like a punch in the gut to me. I, this was uh, really a devastating moment for me uh, when he said this and I, um, you know, I was standing and I needed to sit down, my knees were buckling and, you know, I, I was, I guess, having a panic attack or something. I mean, it really, really hit me. And, um, and he could, the director could tell that, that I'm very upset about this. And he says, but you know, it's not true. 
that's all in the past. Uh, it's just communist propaganda. It's not true. So um, I came back home to Chicago and I, I started talking about it to my father and uh, people of his generation. And I'm like, have you ever heard this crazy story of uh, Jonas Nareka killing Jews? And he's like, oh yeah, I heard it. I'm like, what? How could you have heard this and not told me anything? And they're like, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Why would we talk about it? Why would we, why would we uh, continue propagating this lie? So um, I was shocked that I had never been let in on this rumor. I was shocked that my grandfather was accused of this, of course, which is even worse. Um, but everybody here in Chicago that I talked to just said it's communist propaganda. They, the Russians don't want Lithuania to have any heroes. It's, it's just not true. So uh, for a long time, I was in denial, almost 10 years. And this is one of the big reasons why the book took me so long to write. Um, I couldn't even face it. I had a hard time facing it. Um, I was working on the story very part-time as I was a journalist writing for everybody else except for myself. And I was getting to the point where I was getting very frustrated about this and, um, upset that I couldn't dedicate more time to this. And so I became a high school English teacher to have my summers off so that I could write this book. That that was my plan. And uh, I became a high school teacher in 2007. And uh, I, that was the first summer that I started really having at least a few weeks of time. Because I was a new teacher, there was so much prep and all that, so I didn't have the full 10 weeks. But um, I had at least a few straight weeks of time to work on this. And so that was sort of the beginning of some of the denial, you know, finally going away. Um, as a journalist, I thought that um, I can't ignore this rumor. I'm going to have to address this somehow. I, I can't just like not address it. So uh, then my strategy finally became... I'm going to I'm going to address this rumor but I'm going to figure out a way to exonerate him. So as twisted as all that was, it at least got me looking at the Nazi occupation. So that's how I kind of tricked myself into looking at the whole Nazi occupation. Um So I was finally feeling ready to investigate uh, it, I had to go through several psychological hurdles to get to this point. And then I had some technical hurdles to improve my own writing skills. I already had a master's degree in journalism. Um, I just got a master's degree in teaching so I could have my summers off. But I was, I was having trouble wrapping my mind over how to write the story because in journalism, they only teach you, well, at that time, they, they taught me to write in third person, very objective, very neutral. And I, I, it wasn't really effective. I, I, I knew that much. And um, so I got an MFA in creative nonfiction. And um, my professors let me do use this uh, material as my thesis. And they're the ones that convinced me and said, you have to write this as a memoir because the story is you're coming to terms with what happened to your grandfather and that's what's gonna make it a lot more relevant and current to today's people. So um, so that's why it's a memoir now. And, and this, just this whole process could take like a whole other hours, but that, I'm just gonna throw that in there as that. Anyway. Uh, then I finally coming in, started coming across information that really was very questionable. I found a brochure he wrote called Pekal Galvalietove, or Raise Your Head Lithuanian. And it's essentially like a Mein Kampf in Lithuanian. It, he wrote it 
1933. He had just joined the army and he was only 22 years old. And it's 32 pages long. And nobody had ever talked to me about this brochure that he had written. And I found it in my mom's archives, if you can believe it. Uh, kind of, you know, my mom was organized, but she was not like librarian organized with this material. So sort of tucked away and hidden away in a place that didn't really make sense to me. But anyway, um, I read it and uh, the whole thing was don't buy goods from Jews. Jews are taking over our country. They have all the best positions in the country. It's not fair. Lithuania should be for Lithuanians. Why, why are we giving help and buying products from the Jews when we should be the ones in charge of everything? So it's like this for 32 pages. And uh, this, was, this was the beginning of a turning point for me. Uh, I, I still had one little tiny glimmer of hope that maybe he's not really a perpetrator because he was only 22. And I thought, you know, maybe he's just a hothead. And, um, you know, all of Europe was anti-Semitic. So uh, he was just basically, you know, drinking the Kool-Aid of the day, if you will. And um, inside that brochure, he didn't call for their death. It was It was an economic boycott of their goods. So that's still a long leap, a large leap, you know, to killing them. But anyway, uh, then I, I came across um, another book. And in that book, uh, I have it here. It's Masenia Judinis Lietuvoya, Massive Slaughter in Lithuania. And it's uh, got a lot of Holocaust documents and it's uh divided by cities and i open up to shole where he was the governor and sure enough this is where i found this document and he wrote it he wrote it in august 22nd 1941 and he's calling for all jews and half jews to be rounded up and brought to a ghetto that he wants created in jagare which is uh north of lithuania and uh, they, they were all, more than 2,000 Jews, everybody, all ages, children, grandparents, everything, no, no exceptions, were all rounded up, brought there. And October 2nd, 1941, which was Yom Kippur, uh, they slaughtered them all. So this was, this was, to me, the document that really reoriented my way of thinking, and I changed my mind about him. So um, I continued researching and writing uh, for many years uh, until 2018 at least. Um, and I went through a lot of rejections. Uh, it took me a long time to get a literary agent. Um, but in 2013, that's when I, I got my MFA in creative nonfiction and they my professor said, you're, you're a long way from being done. You actually need to go to Lithuania and conduct your own research. So um, I went in the summer, because that's all a teacher can do. But I, I, I was there for seven weeks. And um, there, you know, I, I spend a lot of pages in, on this in the book. But the, the essentials are, he gave orders to kill 2,000 Jews in Plunge by mid-July 1941. He became head of that Chole district from August 41 to March 43. He contributed to 8,000 deaths under his watch. And so my conclusion uh, is he's a desk murderer. I never found evidence that he personally killed Jews himself, but it doesn't mean he didn't do that. He, he was in the military and he certainly knew how to use a gun. And, uh, but this is a big part of the distortion of Lithuania. They say, well, he just signed documents. He didn't really kill anyone. And so, you know, one thing to ask students is who's guiltier, the ones who shoot or the ones who organize everything? 
so he was he was uh an administrator and he used his skills for this you know awful uh task of how to how to kill how to help kill 95% of the country's Jews and the ones who actually did the shooting in Lithuania it was done by bullets one by one there were there were no massive you know gas chambers or anything like that so so it's true that usually it was the degenerate drunk Lithuanians who did the actual shooting but they they didn't mastermind it. So this is the, the big distinction. Um, so as part of my trip, I uh, hired a Holocaust guide. I, I had a friend, I have a friend in Chicago. He was a Sun Times reporter, Jewish, and he came home at like in twenty early twenty thirteen. Uh, from a trip, a Holocaust trip to Lithuania. I'm like, what's a Holocaust trip? I had never heard of such a thing. And he talks about how Jews go to Lithuania and I guess other countries in Europe to see where their relatives were probably killed. And I said, oh my gosh, this is terrible. I've never heard of such a thing. And uh, we we hang up and then a few a few days later, I had a crazy idea. And I called up my friend Howard and I said, what do you think of my hiring a Holocaust guide to take me to all the places where my grandfather probably played a role in killing Jews? And he said, wow, that's a really, really crazy idea, but it's good. And um, initially Simas said, no, he didn't want to do it. He, he didn't want to deal with the perpetrators granddaughter was too much for him. He lost relatives in the Holocaust in Lithuania. But after a few weeks, he changed his mind. He started looking into my grandfather's uh, life and story. And he said, you know what? He's a very fascinating man. In so many ways, he encapsulates World War II Lithuania because everything happened to him. He did everything. All the highlights that Lithuania went through. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting more interested in this and I would like to do this. So he played a big role uh, in my finding a lot of things out too. Um, I interviewed the director of the Genocide Resistance and Re Research Center with, with Simus's help. He, he pushed me to do it. I, I didn't want to do it. I was very reluctant, but I'm so glad he pushed me. And I asked her, what do you think about these documents my grandfather signed to kill, you know, to not to, they don't, they don't specify to kill the Jews. They only specify to round them up and bring them to the ghetto. And this is another uh, defense that Lithuanians say that the documents don't say to kill Jews. But it took me a long time to realize Hitler never even wrote a document to kill Jews. None of them did. There, is no, there are no documents that explicitly call for killing, them, except in the Wansi, doc, Wansi conference, there's that final solution. But individually, there, there is nothing that explicitly calls for killing them like that in these orders. Everybody just, you know, understood, I guess. It was an understanding between everyone. Anyway, she said, her answer was, it's hard to know what he really felt when he signed that document. So she just presumed his innocence. And that's what Lithuanians do. They just presume innocence. Um, so anyway, in 2018, the, another thing that made the story really blow up was um, I met this uh, man named Grant Goshen. And he's a Litvak, a, a Lithuanian Jew from South Africa who now lives in California. And we were, he independently from me, he was investigating my grandfather too. We didn't even know about each other yet. And um, he discovered that my grandfather played a role in killing 100 of his relatives. And he became very angry to discover that my grandfather's hailed as a hero. And so he uh, launched a lawsuit against the Genocide Resistance Research Center, which defends the good name of Jonas Nareka. 
Long story short, he went through all the courts, there's five courts, and he lost every single time. Lost is probably not the correct legal term, they just dismissed it. So they, didn't, they never really looked at it on its merits. Anyway, he didn't give up. He brought the case now to the European Court of Human Rights, and he just filed it this past February. And uh, it'll take a year for them to decide if they want to take it. It's a real long shot because they only take 5% of the cases filed. So if they do take it, it's going to be a really, really, really big deal. But 95% is chances that he won't. Um, so uh, I finally started going public with the story myself. I had been keeping it a big secret until about 2018. So for 18 years. By this point, I needed. A, I wanted a literary agent, and they all want authors to have platforms, which means you have to start getting published and some kind of a following. Um, so I wrote an article for Salon.com that was my first big thing, and it did go viral. And uh, shortly after that, I got a literary agent and a publisher. And then uh, the Olga Lengel Institute connected with me. And then uh, through Harry Wall, I, I got connected to this group. All right. So the denial continues. Um, in 2019, a Lithuanian who was running for the European Parliament was so upset that he took it upon himself to just vandalize the, pla the plaque. And I do have a 30 second video because it is rather dramatic. So let's see if this works. Did I lose it already? I had it up. Oh, this is it. Hey. All right, hopefully you guys can hear it. So very dramatic. Uh, so in chat, go ahead and put, guess what happened next? What, what, what do you think happened after that? You'll have to help me, Stephen, read, read what comes up. Um, no worries. Uh, they put that he was arrested or the school got renamed. Um, let's see, uh, he was in charge of vandalism, uh, and they continued in their efforts in denial. Sure. Um, again, arrested, still denied. Yes. Another, another plaque was, re uh, replaced it. And the plaque went back, another plaque went back up. Uh, someone actually said the school got renamed. School did not get renamed, but I love the guess. Uh, I love that you're participating. He was still regarded as a hero. Uh, someone just said nothing, nothing happened. Um, okay. No, no change at all. Well, here's the new and improved plaque they put up. It's even better than the old one. Oh, wow. It was put up within a few months. 
So it's even better than the other one. That's what happened. And is that, I see the, the, the picture and flags there. Was that a ceremony for that? Or? Yeah, people, the people who put it up, you know, he's got a lot of uh, followers. And, uh, you know, they put it up with rousing folk music and had a big party over it. And they were, you know, the bad guy was the vandal. He was the bad guy. And my grandfather's the good guy. So they're defending the country's good name, my grandfather's good name, and vilifying uh, uh, Thomas, Stanislavus Thomas, the one who, he, he, he slung that sledgehammer 14 times. I've watched that video so often. It's 14 times that he slung that sledgehammer. All right, so um, if you were gonna use the book, these are some uh, thoughts that I had. Uh, it's a study in Holocaust distortion. The book is structured in three parts, braided with excerpts from the, that lawsuit of Grant. So uh, you get the sense of what the country is doing to defend Jonas Noreka with my very slow reveal of coming to terms uh, with what is happening with my grandfather. So parts one and two um, basically is kind of a study of how denial works. And then part three is, was, is really uncovering the truth and how distortion works. And I do have lesson plans. Steven showed you where to find them. Um, so I made them for, uh, I spent all last week on these guys. So, uh, and I, and I'm, uh, I'm not a social studies teacher, but I literally showed five social studies teachers, uh, that lesson plan and they, they really liked it and they had a little tweaks here and there to make it even better. Um, so I could go through that if I could figure out how to access it. Um, it might be, well, we have some, uh, we might have some questions. We are gonna have, uh, real quick, we are gonna have some time. I'm gonna leave things open during, uh, to come back for lunch to continue Q and A. So you could get, you wanna go through it or would you rather do uh, answer some of the questions that we'll were posted? Questions with? because they can download. You can also find them on sylviafodi.com for educators, for educators and book clubs. For language arts teachers, I would look at the social science lesson plan, at least for context when you teach it. I put in an anticipation guide, whole book discussion questions, chapter by chapter discussion questions, um, and then essay prompts. So yeah, it, it is really, it is, it is really a very comprehensive and incredible uh, lesson. I mean, both both are are, are great and fantastically pair up with the book and for social studies teachers, primary sources that are in there. I mean, it's it's really incredible, especially in uh, discussing Holocaust denial and distortion. So, uh, Really, really well done. Thank so, you. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, all that time, we really appreciate all that time you put into those lessons. Uh, for, so the first, first question comes from uh, uh, Renee O'Connor. So did you have any family members that were not on board with your decision to write this book that opposed it? Yeah, my brother was very supportive, but um, my grandfather, my father wished that I didn't write it. Uh, he his new wife says it makes Lithuania look bad. So she didn't think I should write it. The Lithuanian community here is very cold and frigid about the whole thing um, in Chicago. I mean, there's some who are reading it, but you know, I don't know, 20% maybe, but most of the community is, uh, does not want to deal with it. Um, <clears throat> And I have relatives in Lithuania who are very upset. I, and I was very open with everybody. I said, I'm, I'm doing this with, with the Jews. And I guess nobody thought the book would get this big. And now that it's this big, they're, they're very upset. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so let's, let's go to the next question. Um, so someone asked, I'm not sure, I, I, I might have missed this as well, but what part uh, did uh, this part in the Catholic faith play in the family's denial or reluctance to tell his story? For me, I'm a practicing Catholic. Um, so for me, my Catholic faith played a big role in ultimately getting over my denial. 
and looking at the terrible truth. Um, I've been praying over this and I always do and I still do uh, that it is that that I discovered was the truth and as bad as it is I think it's important to face it and as uncomfortable as it is for Lithuanians to face it it's nothing compared to what the Jews went through so um, and you know I also think the best path through traumas to face it before because Lithuania this will be good I mean of course it would be very good from Jews to hear that Lithuania did the guilt but this would also be good for Lithuanians themselves to admit to it it would it would be the healthiest response for them definitely uh, and, and but you don't see that happening I don't know. I joke that probably not in my lifetime. Um, uh, so I'm going to go to a question. Uh, and that was from that question was from uh, Ed Kenzel. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, Brandy Edie uh, had a question uh, about, and I kind of you've kind of talked about it. But I want to make sure that you know uh, if you had any other response from Lithuania from people in Lithuania after the book was released. I, I am getting positive responses too. Like people are emailing me and sending me really nice letters and uh, some friends are telling me that they're just blown away with this and, and that it's completely changed their view of Lithuania. I mean, one friend said the fairy tale's over because the fairy tale is Lithuania was just a victim of the Nazis and the communists. And it's just poor Lithuania had no agency and poor Lithuania was the one that was occupied, and poor Lithuania was the one that was injured. That's been the fairy tale that we all grew up with. Not the, the, this part that they played any role in killing Jews was completely not part of the story. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, that's a great response, great response. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so Sherry Livingston would like to ask a question. Um, does your experience and what, what you uncovered about your grandfather affect how you teach when you talk about the Holocaust? Do you talk about it in your class and, uh, you know, have your students make connections with the consequences of, you know, the you know, people who stand by or maybe even denial uh, you know, based on your experience with your grandfather? How has that changed how you teach? It, ha it has changed. You know, I've been working on this book uh, for 21 years and teaching for 15 of those years. And I've been talking about my grandfather almost since, you know, 2007 when I first started teaching, but it was always like, I'm working on the book, I'm trying to get this, I'm learning this. And it wasn't until 2018 when all the press started coming out that it was like, do you want to see this uh, front page story on the New York Times and let's discuss it? Do you want to see this front page story on the Chicago Tribune and see it? Do you want to see what BBC said? Uh, so then I would start bringing in all the media about it. Um, and I do bring up a lot of discussion about, uh, and this is from my own, when I was a student, I always loved these discussions, upstander, bystander, uh, perpetrator. And, you know, I think the statistics are 2% of the country are perpetrators and about 2% are upstanders and most do nothing. And so uh, what do we need to do to be an upstander? And um, when I was teaching that in the back of my head was buzzing this whole story and I'm like, I would like to be an upstander. And uh, I feel like writing this book is being an upstander. I wasn't there in 1941, but I'm here in 2021. And uh, so that's what I tell myself. And that's what I tell my students. I would I would agree. I mean, you not only that, but how you uh, when you're speaking out, continuing writing lesson plans for teachers to use in, in classrooms. I I, I definitely think uh, you definitely qualify as an upstander, and it's just uh, really applaud you because it must have been hard uh, writing this book, finding out things about you know your family. Um, one of the actually one of the questions. Uh, that just came up from uh, Kimberly Young is, uh, you know, she said she found out recently that her son had Jewish ancestry. How, how do you come to terms with learning something negative about your heritage and how, how do you come to terms with it redefining your identity? 
it was it was psychologically hard i would say uh it, it had its toll you know for a while i was depressed <clears throat> for a long time i couldn't sleep um i had a it it, it it had a toll on my family um it changed my whole identity of who i thought i was i was a very proud lithuanian and in many ways now i'm a very ashamed lithuanian and but talking about this book is cathartic for me and that's what actually makes me feel better because it redresses the evil in some way i hope it had to have been it had to have been really difficult i can only imagine um and uh, let's see we'll go to let's go to another question um have you ever been uh you know persecuted or vilified because of the book and the story have you had anything you know reach out to you i mean i know people do there's hate mail and other things come out but has anything ever happened to you negatively because of the book and the story associated with it um it's just hate I, you know it's just hate mail it hasn't really gotten to any physical danger i think if i had if i were in lithuania a high school teacher in Lithuania and had come out with the story, I would have lost my job. But being a high school teacher in the United States, my high school gave me a sabbatical for this book, to, to promote this book this year. I got a sabbatical from my United States high school. If I were in Lithuania, I, I, I would have lost my job. So I think only an American, you know, or someone outside of Lithuania would have had the security and the safety net to do something like this. I, it would be too difficult for a Lithuanian to do it, I think. Because you would be too much at their mercy. And I'm not at their mercy, luckily. Yeah, that, luckily for, yeah, definitely luckily for us. I'm so glad you have a sabbatical. It, it kind of helping you with that, especially being able to, uh, you know, do more to talk about your book and being able to engage and even write in these uh, phenomenal lesson plans and speak here. We're just really, really thankful for that. Um, so what uh, grade level, as far as you know, looking at your book and the lessons, what grade level do you think you recommend for uh, these lessons and also for your book? And I know, you know I've looked at your you know, the book as far as the you know, size is it you know read in whole is it looking at you know components of it and uh, you know what, how do you recommend using that i mean if you have the time ideally uh, in a you know in a language arts class probably for upper level junior seniors uh the whole book i think would be really good um probably in a social studies class just parts of the book and then all the you know, I have links to all these primary source documents that I used for the book. Um, to, to just study the denial in between each chapter, I have a little excerpt of that lawsuit that Grant put. And as hard as it is to read, it's very unusual that they're on the record explaining themselves. And so this is the part that's the denial part that's in between each chapter. Um, you know, that I think is so useful to study because it's on the record. This is not just, nobody can say that they're not in denial. And this is, you know, the highest levels of the government, the court system, everything. They are, they have leaned into their denial and distortion and it's right all there in black and white. Yeah, that thing would be great to use. Uh, real quick, I just want to say something. Um, if uh, this is uh, technically the, the optional uh, Q&A and lunch session, I will be going into that in a minute after we close out with, uh, with Sylvia, I don't know if she's going to join or not. But I'm, I'm going to leave uh, the, the chat open as well as I'm going to open up the session. But it is optional. This is your lunch break. If you need to go now, feel free. Take the time. Enjoy your lunch. I'll have coffee and uh, and then we'll see you back uh, about one o'clock unless you have any questions for me and in the lunch session I'm actually going to unmute microphones so if you have if you want to talk and engage or even go into your community that you have for any uh, and and have some uh, post some discussion uh, questions look at the documents come up with new things if you'd like to talk about uh, I would love to be able to help if you have any technical questions I'll also be on to be able to answer those as well. Uh, and one, uh, so I think I've got, uh, I'm going to, so I'm going to stay on here and let Sylvia answer a couple more questions. 
uh, and if you need to go, feel free to go now. Um, and then we'll, and Eric, you want to join the next session when I start it. So Sylvia, if you don't mind, can you mind no. taking a couple more questions? No, not at all. Wonderful. So uh, do you have any regrets about all everything you've done to publish this book and everything you've gone through? And uh, this is from Nancy Lee Thompson. And uh, when did you become Catholic? Uh, well, I was born Catholic, so I've always been Catholic. Um, it played a toll in my family. So it, it, in that sense, there, there was a lot of difficulty there. I don't know that I would have done it differently though, because I'm, I am happy the book's out and I, I am happy. I think it's a very, very important story even though many sacrifices were made to get it out. Um, so I feel like, you know, I made a promise to my mom to write this book. This is not the book she would have wanted me to write, but I, I feel very good about myself that I got it out and that it's done. So in that sense, I, I feel very proud about, my, about all that. That's there was fantastic. a price though, there was a price. <laughs> And, and I'm sure it's going to be difficult to reconcile with that. Um, have you had any, and this is, uh, well, we got a question from, uh, from our education director, Rachel Lucy Hitt. How, can you tell us about uh, any interactions you've had with descendants of your grandfather's victims? They're um, very positive reactions. They're, they're just so grateful because they knew this story. Jews have known, Litvaks have known this. Lithuanians are the ones who've been in denial over it. So uh, I get very, very positive notes and letters, uh, accolades of just gratitude. And then they share, of course, their own family stories of what happened. And they're glad that finally a Lithuanian is facing it. Because they've been so frustrated that Lithuania has just been getting away with it and in denial over the whole thing. So they're, they're, they've been very supportive and it's very emotional to talk to them, um, you know, and interact with them. I'm sure, I'm sure that's gotta be difficult, but I'm so, I think they're, they're I would assume they're probably glad that you do and that you've spoken out and written this book. Um, that's you know, really wonderful that you have. Let's I mean, see. I think there are some that are, you know, it's. I think it's always hard to face a perpetrator's granddaughter. Um, but there, there is something very healing about it for both of us, I think, uh, because I'm willing to face the truth. Now, you know, if I were not, it would not be a, a good experience. But because I am, I think that that's so helpful and healing to descendants of the victims. Your feelings, I mean, is it, is it, is it helping, I know, reconciling with, you know, the actions of your grandfather and then him being regarded as a hero? Um, I mean, how does it sit on you and make you feel? Is it healing for you as well? I mean, when you talk to victims, um, how does that, how do those feelings sit with you on a regular basis? It's been a very, very long journey, but today I feel good talking about it. And I feel like it's a long, it's a long overdue conversation. It's 80, it's a year, 80 year overdue conversation. And I'm glad, you know, even Lithuanians who are resistant to this, they'll say, like they'll say, She's just a granddaughter. She's not a PhD in history. What does she know? But it's good that the country's talking about it. So, um, yeah, I am just the granddaughter. I, do, I don't have a PhD in history. All that is true. But I have three master's degrees, and I, I teach English, and, and I foster critical thinking. There's a lot of inferencing that has to, had to have been done. For this, it's it's a study in inferencing. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Well, I think I've said that just because uh, someone has a, a 
uh, three little letters after their name doesn't necessarily mean they haven't put in the work and the effort and uh, uh, have the knowledge level to, uh, that especially in the passion that you've had to complete this and really go in, uh, in the depth you've had to go into and even the, the personal connection that you had to, I mean, it's not like you were you know, doing this arbitrarily and, you know, having to face up the truths with someone that you, you know, looked up to and respected uh, that I, I don't think, it, I, I think it's, uh, you were just the right person to do it. Um, but I think that is the last question. Thank you so much for uh, for speaking with us today. I hope that you're going to stay for some of the other sessions and I feel am. free to jump in uh, unless you're going to have a lunch yourself. We love having you. Uh, and you might see Sylvia pop up in the chat as well. Um, again, we do. if you want to send Sylvia a message through, uh, through the Whova app, you're more than welcome to send messages uh, through the app tour. We are going to try to make sure that we keep the chats uh, kind of like tailored to each session. That way the topics are uh, are maintained, their integrity is maintained for each individual topic. But if you've got questions to ask Sylvia, you can also post them in the chat for this session, but the next one will start a new chat session over. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end this session here. I'm going to start the lunch session. And again, it's optional just if you have any questions. And if you uh, don't, feel free to enjoy your lunch. I may step away for a minute just for a brief break, but I uh, really appreciate all of you being here. Thank you so much, so much, Sylvia, for talking with us today and for sharing your lesson plans and, and helping uh, me as well. This has been a fantastic session and I really appreciate it. Thank we'll you for ahead. having me. I, I, I'm so happy I was able to come and join you. And everyone, and by the way, and, and many people, most everyone has posted in the chat. Just thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.